It's the summertime. We're all dressed in summer attire. But for a Penn State football player, it's the summertime, and the living is anything but easy. Never a dull moment around here as Penn State looks to keep up with their national rankings ahead of next season and also on the recruiting trail where it's anything but quiet. Staff fell down when they saw me wearing a pink shirt. It must be June. True. Blue White Pulse is next. <laughs> Great, great to be with you on the Blue White Pulse. Steve Jones, Audrey Snyder, DKSports.com, Pittsburgh, Jay Paterno. Great to have everybody on board. Yeah, it's uh, anything but fun and games this <laughs> time of the year, isn't it? It's uh, one of Absolutely. those where a lot of work is getting done, the work that we don't see. Mm -hmm. Everything with the strength coach, right? I mean, he's the guy, Dwight Gold, who can have the most contact with these guys. So you'll see him out there in the sand pits, weight room, and as soon as we know it, then it'll be lift for life and we're back to it. Uh, no question, and it goes faster than you can even imagine, especially when you're a coach, because this is all happening when you're not there. Um, this is the time the coaches actually get a little block of time to spend with their families, mm -hmm. um, and you just hope that they're doing the right things. Yeah, you know, it's if we go back 30 years, maybe even 35 years, players would get into some shape, but then in camp, two a days would get you into shape. <laughs> now you're expected no Jay to walk in being in shape on mm -hmm. day one. Yeah, we, it used to be guys, everybody went home and they had cards that they filled out and they'd send them back in. And you, <laughs> as a coach, you hope they were actually doing what they wrote on the cards. And we used to refer to that as the pencil workout. Yeah, I lifted my pencil today and refilled out the card. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's a different world now. And uh, in some ways, it's better. Some ways, it's a little tougher on the kids. And you can't even have those two days anymore either. No, That's the other thing. Yeah, two days are gone. Don't, don't even get me yeah. started on that. Don't even get me started on that. I mean, come on. We'll see if we see any hamstring injuries That's early season. That's a ridiculous season. rule. End of story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Okay. I won't go there. <laughs> I apologize. I didn't even bring it up. <laughs> she did. She did. I want to Getting everybody riled up. For. <laughs> We're already bantering. Look at that. We're already doing it. All right. Uh, in basketball, basketball is a different world mm -hmm. in terms of how everything's treated. It's a longer season, but the coaches have more latitude with individual player development workouts in the off season. Football doesn't have that. Is football wrong or is football right? I think you have to say they're wrong. I mean, you look at this point. I mean, coaches want the hands on time, right? I mean, I think that's, that's safe to say they're out recruiting. They have other things to do. But then you look at it, and as Jay mentioned earlier, when do they get that free time? You have the dead period coming up, so that will be something for them to get away. But you look at it, the team's turned over to the strength staff. I mean, this is all of them from here on out getting these guys ready. So, yeah, I think basketball's got, got the better idea with it. Well, it gives you more time. Now, the problem is with football is, again, you're getting that one time a year where a coach can have a personal life, mm -hmm. um, yeah. where they can go and spend time. And are you going to take that away? So it's a fine line. It's be careful what you wish for because you may get – same thing with the early, recruit, the, uh, early yeah. signing right. period. Oh, we're going to have visits yeah. in the summer now. Well, guess what? Your wife is going to look at you and say, we got two or three kids here. In my case, I had five. Right. Um, but, you know, when are we going to spend right. some time together? When are you going to actually be a father? Well – in basketball, it's like two hours here, two hours there. I'm not talking about a full 40-hour right. week. I'm saying, should the head coach have a little more latitude as to how the eight hours a week is spent between strength and conditioning and player development? Yeah. That's my question. Oh, I agree. I think there's a fine line there. And I think you can do both where it's two hours a week. And when we, we would have three or four weeks in the summer where guys were in, coaches were in and out. There always had to be two coaches in the office in case something happened yeah. or, or to be around so kids could come in and ask questions, that kind of thing. So, like I said, it would be easy to manage. Hey, how do you look at that? I mean, player development. I mean, I, I think you take it, and the kids, obviously, let's, let's be honest, I mean, they're taking classes. They're busy around right. the clock, so you're adding one more thing to their plate. But like Jay said, with the coaches getting a personal life, I mean, there's there's no break. Uh, see, that's why I was never in favor of these, these mini camps all over the place. Coaches yeah. were forced, you know, based on what Harbaugh was doing, that everybody's flying all over the place. <laughs> like, for goodness Settling sakes, I mean, stuff, you know, yeah. it's not a 24-7 thing. You've got to have some sort of life, don't you? Well, I talk don't know. To, in talking to some guys, you know, even a guy like Urban Meyer has talked about how his personal life has changed and how he's carved out time specifically to spend with his family, specifically mm -hmm. to spend with his wife. So I think there's a balance. I think guys are going to find it. Yeah, counting down to camp now. 
mean, let's face it. I don't want to wish away my days, Steve. I, I want my time. <laughs> hey, you want, oh, and, and how does Audrey spend That's her right. time? <laughs> a lot of trips to the beach. A lot of trips to the beach. Well, we spend a lot of time like that as well. We get a, just a little downtime here, the whole thing. And then I end up doing spikes games. For exactly. <laughs> hey, time. something has to happen uh, around here. Uh, something happens, and I enjoy it. And we're going to have four of them on the on WHVL TV this summer, so we're looking forward to that very much. Coming up, we're, this is a really offense-focused show, and we're going to take a look at the Penn State offense in more detail coming up as we continue with the Blue White Pulse with Audrey Snyder, Jay Paterno, Steve Jones. Great to have you with us here on WHVL. Welcome back, Blue White Pulse. Great to have you with us. And uh, let's get to the Penn State offense. And, you know, the numbers just scream out what they did last year. We know what they did last year. But it put so much juice into everything Penn mm -hmm. State did, Audrey, into the stands, into Absolutely. the stats, and also into the Ticket season sales. itself. Ticket sales, <laughs> everything. I mean, offense sells yeah. sells, t sells tickets. They Absolutely. did all that. What did you think of the, the strides they made last year? I, you know, I, we saw the stride, Steve, as the season progressed, and I think you always expect that. When a team comes out, it's going to take the offense a little while to kind of get their footing. But what we saw toward the end, I mean, it was fantastic. So can you pick up there? But the one glaring issue was the slow starts. And I asked James Franklin about it during the coach's caravan this spring, and he said, you know, I think it's just youth and that they were able to get the guys in there at the locker room. Well, you have to wonder if maybe it goes beyond that a little bit. Um, you know, if, if there's something preparation-wise they can change. I know this spring – Defensive coordinator Brent Price said they did work on it in practice, trying to get off the better starts. Right. So yeah, definitely they, a big thing. They specifically planned it. Uh, I, I know there there were certain years, for example, out of 13 games, you know, there were times eight, nine times you'd score on the opening drive. Is there a way to to prep for it, or is there something to be said of the fact of getting a feel for what's going on and then figuring out where to go? Well, with certain teams, like when Wisconsin was that ball control team oh, yeah. that they've been, you wanted to try and get ahead of them and get them out of their game. Um, but I think, you know, the, the important thing is when you start the game, you have certain formations you want to see. You have certain personnel groups you want to see. And in those first 10 or 12 plays that you script, you want to say, hey, when we go to three wide, are they on first and second down? Are they going to go to nickel? Because if so, we're going to run the ball. If they don't go to nickel, you know, we're going to throw it and get, make their linebackers cover. So you try and find those things out. And sometimes they play it well to start out, and then it comes down to making adjustments. Right. So I think it, the important thing is everybody likes to talk about the opening drive, but, you know, it's, it's how you finish, not how you start. Right. And, you know, I think that's the most important thing. And they have finished very, very well. They have finished obviously. really, really well. Now here's a, just a graphic look at, you know, how they've started in games. And you see in terms of the, you know, the, the points, first half to second half, I think they actually scored in their opening drive, I think, five or six times this year mm -hmm. on their opening drive. So it wasn't as yeah. graphically bad as, 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 as people have made it mm -hmm. out to be. But the second half has been so outstanding that, you know, oh. I mean, that's <laughs> – it's, it's incredible. Wisconsin I mean, found out firsthand. And, and, you know, going back to what Jay's point about, you know, kind of seeing what you have and baiting people. I mean, you go back to Wisconsin and their shot plays that second half. Watch Joe Moorhead on the sideline. If anyone goes back, I'm sure people will rewatch that one. Uh, right at the end of the half. Him and Trace McSorley are having a conversation. They knew that they could hit on that shot play deep to open up the second half, and they yeah. did for the touchdown. Right. Well, usually by you – know, the thing about this offense that people don't realize is they started out the year with the run-pass option. All right. And people started to say, well, you know, we're going to jump inside that slot receiver. We're going to take that away, and we're going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. So, to the credit, they've made adjustments, and they've been mm -hmm. gotten the one-on-one -on -one plays on the outside and the jump balls. Uh, and that's what you're relying on, and that's – hopefully that can continue. But, again – you got to give the other guy credit too. They're going to make some right. things. And the other thing about the second half, you got to give some credit to as well, is the defense made some adjustments at halftime, got the ball back more for them. When you look yep. at some of those games, the defensive team really gave them more possessions mm -hmm. and got turnovers and made things happen too as well. So it's you know it goes hand in hand. And keeping the quarterback upright as they've been able to replenish the scholarships. Look at the numbers of the sacks. How the sacks went down replenishing the offensive line with numbers, more maturity there with a mobile quarterback. What does the mobile quarterback <laughs> mean to that? Changes the whole game from your sack game. Every offensive line coach in America wants a mobile quarterback <laughs> yeah. to then go, hey, we only gave up 12 sacks. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the last six or seven years when we were playing with Michael Robinson and, and Daryl Clark and those kind of guys, um, we never had won 22 sacks in a season, partly because they could get out of trouble and throw the ball away. And, and you want to coach them to throw the ball away because that takes away from your sacks. Um, but no question. I think the, the, the key thing this year is going to be when we get in the offensive line discussions, how strong are they up the middle? Mm -hmm. Because McSorley's not a tall guy. Right. And if they're, they're going to get a lot of, of contain end rush to keep him in the pocket and make him throw over guys. It's going to be important that they keep that pocket as, as curved as they can so he can throw out of there. 
Which means you create lane. You can create lanes for a quarterback in the pocket. You yep. can create yep. a lane for him to throw. Uh, the running backs, uh, <laughs> a obviously, lot <laughs> a lot of them. Uh, so how important is it to keep some sort of mix where not only everybody's fresh, but mm -hmm. everybody's in engaged? I think early season we're going to see that. I mean, you look at Penn State, you open up non-conference play, that's really a time to see more of Andre Robinson, more of Miles Sanders. Uh, but after that, I mean, you've got to keep Barkley fresh. And he's never been shy to kind of, they call it tapping out, or tap out every once in a while, let somebody else go in. But you have to have the depth there, and they have that. I mean, that should be one of the strongest points of their offense. Yeah, you look at what they were able to do. Andre Robinson, when he stepped in, played well. Mark Allen played well. We mm -hmm. saw the flashes from Miles Sanders to go at Barkley. And the fact that Barkley is unselfish about, about, hey, look, he's as happy when Mark Allen scores as when he scores. I mean, that just tells you everything about him. More on the offense in just a few moments as we continue with Blue Eye Pulse after this. Welcome back to the Blue Eye Paul, Steve, Audrey, Jay. Great to have you with us. Uh, going deep. That's one thing. <laughs> the deep ball is, is something that's really exciting. Look at Penn State's numbers on the deep ball from last season and the distribution. I mean, this is taking Godwin out of, out yeah. of the mix. I mean, sometimes there's, Jay, a deep threat. They've got multiple deep threats. Well, Ham Hamilton, I think, is a guy we're going to see some real good yeah. things out of. And, you know, and, and I think there's the same kind of excitement for Hamilton here in State College as there is on Broadway for that show. <laughs> and we'll see if he can match that kind of excitement. But, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things with this offense that you have. Is you have Gesicki as a tall receiver. You've got a wide range of guys you can throw to on the edge. But the, the other thing about it is you've got Barkley, who is a legitimate threat downfield, out of the backfield. So there is not a time where you can say, I don't have to cover this guy or that guy. Everybody can make a play. And that's what I think really gives this offense the flexibility to do some of the things that they're doing. Absolutely. And I think you look at that too. And Saeed Blacknell is a guy. You saw it in the Big Ten title game. You've seen it in glimpses in the past, seemingly always in the big games is when Blacknell steps up. Uh, but if they can get some chunk plays from him, I think Pazicki's going to have a huge factor again this year. Uh, but kind of looking at this whole picture, I mean, this is an offense that about 16% of their plays were of their determination of the chunk right. variety last year. So can that be duplicated, the 50-50 balls? Uh, you have to kind of think so because they're loaded. I mean, you look at the Big Ten title game and then in the Rose Bowl, mm -hmm. Gasicki made two big catches. He had the first touchdown catch. The basketball skill that he brings mm -hmm. to a football field, I don't think it's something that could be underestimated with the, no. with the height and also the ability to get the ball at the high point. He's, I believe, has the highest vertical leap on the team. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, guy's 6'6", six, six, and Dwight Gold always raves about him in the weight room. So just a freak athlete, and he really put it together last year, and now it's kind of taking that next step for him. Now the next step, Irv Charles and Juwan Johnson. It looked like mm -hmm. Juwan Johnson was definitely making strides in the spring. Irv Charles made some. But how important is it to get just a couple of other guys into the mix that bring more threats to the table? Well, I think, you know, everybody says you're loaded, and you are loaded on day one. But if you start to get some guys hurt, you know, if something happens to Gesicki, you may have to take a Blacknall or somebody and line him up as in Remember, that Blacknall fight. got uh, uh, dinged up a yep, little bit yep, early yeah. last season. So you, you got, hopefully you have guys that if you get some guys hurt that you can slide guys around. Um, but I think the, the real challenge for this offense is going to be if they get into a game where a team says we're not giving up the big ball, big, big throws, mm -hmm. can they get into a second and six, third and two, first mm -hmm. and ten, second and three, uh, third and one, first down? Can they get into a drive? Because you look at the majority of their drives, their scoring drives, there's not a lot of third downs in there. It's right. a lot mm -hmm. of first down, second down, first down, right. first down, second down, and it's chunk plays. And sometimes you get that mentality, and it's hard when you have to start playing patient. We went through that in the 95 season, sure. starting off in 94 against Wisconsin. We just did not play patient. Yeah. And we pressed, and they were just going to say, we're going to frustrate them, and we're going to hold the ball. So that's going to be the challenge to see if they can win a game like that. In fact, I believe Penn State got 46 or 47% of its offense on first down. I mean, they, yeah. they did a great job on first down. Then they set up second down. And you're right. They didn't have – I think Penn State, I think, had, I want to say 30 – 
maybe 35 fewer third down plays than the opponent had last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were fired. A, which is good because they weren't, you know, that's the one area. When I mean, you look at the right. offense, that you say they've got to get better as a third down. There's no question mm -hmm. about it. You know, you know, 117th or whatever it was in the country on yeah. third yeah. downs. Got to do better now because you, if you get into a game like that, you look at the fourth quarter of the USC game, a couple yeah. of third downs they make. Absolutely. Right. The game's over, they win it. Um, uh, yeah, what about ball security now? Uh, I mean, you know, it, yes. it's, 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 a big, it's a big play offense in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. So, I mean, what about the ball security part? Early it was an issue, later not. Uh, yeah, they really were able to put it to rest. And I think it was a matter of once they got comfortable. I mean, you saw a lot of issues last year with the center. Of course, they're going to have a new center this year with Connor McGovern, who they're really pleased with this spring. Uh, but once they settled in, they were good. So, I think, you know, you kind of make it a point of emphasis early on. James Franklin reinforced it a lot during practices last year. But after that, they were fine. So, I think they, sh they should be okay with it. What about the offensive line part? Now, now you have more parts available, and they seem to have linemen that have some versatility that can play multiple spots. Does that help an offensive line coach and an offensive line when you have guys that can play multiple spots? Oh, it's huge on an offensive line because you never know when somebody's getting hurt. And right. You want to cross train so that your five best offensive linemen are in the game at all time. Um, you don't want to say, well, he's our second left tackle. We don't have anybody else that knows it, and you got a better guy sitting on the bench. Right. So I think that's important. The second thing is they have to have an understanding of what the other guy's dealing with. If I'm the if I'm the right guard, I got to know the center's got. We if we ID the linebacker to the left, I got to know. I got to help him with that nose that's shaded my side. I got to know what his problems are, whether it's a run play. So those things are very very important, and we always want to try and cross train guys to understand everybody else's role. And Audrey. We don't know what the status of Andrew Nelson would be in terms of mm -hmm. rehab and where he's right. going to be at when he starts. But if he were to be a really good contributor for them, what would that mean? It would be huge. I mean, it, you look at this as a team. James Franklin said this spring that during the caravan that Andrew Nelson will have some role on this team. You won't go into details. But I think you look at Ryan Bates as a guy who's pretty much locked in at left tackle. You look over at the right side, Chaz Wright kind of yeah. comes out of nowhere last year. So having Nelson would be huge to give you the flexibility because they had so many injuries last year. Coming up, we'll wrap up the Blue White Pulse as we continue in just a few moments. We'll talk about several issues as we continue after this. Welcome back. We'll touch on some issues here down the stretch. Uh, first of all, let's talk about with the Penn State incoming recruiting class. 84 players are on campus right now. The rest of them will show up at the end of June. You can see this is the offensive guys. Then we'll flip over and show you the defensive guys. Now, Jay, how difficult is it, you know, because you're making that move from high school to college, how difficult is it for someone to come in and contribute right away? Well, there's a couple of positions where it's relatively easy. Wide receiver, running back, defensive back. Further, State, further away from the, the ball, ball, the easier it is. Right, and, and they have the least to think about. When you think about it, Penn State's loaded in those positions. So I don't, I don't think you'll see eight, ten freshmen playing. You'll probably see a handful, and, and special teams is the other place you see a Absolutely. lot of contrib contributions. Yeah. And we also had a chance to see some some freshmen. Four of them came in early. Mm -hmm. Now, two of them didn't go, but two did, Mike Miranda right. and, and Lamont Wade. The benefit of getting in early, what did you think of that? Oh, it's huge. And James Franklin always talks about that. And you look at Lamont Wade, of course, he's a guy you're going to spend a lot of time this summer or fall talking about. Uh, he's going to have a big role for this team. But the fact that a guy like Miranda physically came in and really seemed to do well in the yeah. weight room, according to Dwight Galt, that's huge, too, getting those guys in, getting them in the strength and conditioning program. Uh, but moving forward, I, you mentioned special teams. Journey Brown, the running back, who defended his gold in the 100-meter dash, set a record, PIA record, earlier uh, last month. He's a guy who's going to get a shot as a punt returner, he was telling me. So do you maybe burn the red shirt for a guy to be a punt returner? We'll have to see. But Mac Hippenhammer, yeah. receiver, he'll also get a look there. So keep an eye on them. Now, recruiting is obviously a 24-7 mm -hmm. thing. It's uh, on message boards. It's a 24-7 really? thing. Which then stunningly brings with it, Audrey, gnashing of teeth when it doesn't yes. go the way the fan base wants. Shocker, right? Uh, Justin Fields, the five-star quarterback, decommitted from Penn State earlier this week. And, you know, you look at it, and this is a loaded quarterback from Jay. I mean, you kind of, you know, Fields hasn't ruled out coming to Penn State, but tell me the last time a kid decommitted to a place and then ended <laughs> up there. I can't think of one. Uh, but the fact that, you know, Micah Parsons, five-star defensive end, decommits, it's not a, you know, not a time to hit the panic button. This is still a top five class. But what you're seeing is with elite kids, they're going to look around. They're going to play this back and forth game to find the best fit for them. And so be it. That's, I mean, that's recruiting. That's what happens. But with the loss of fields, Penn State will likely rebound, find somebody else. But you do want to get that quarterback in your class early, ideally, so they can be a leader and help to bring on other guys. Yeah, and you know, the thing that happens a lot with the recruiting attention is so big. 
huge. They commit, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, nobody's talking about them anymore. <laughs> yeah. And some of these guys, well, you know, how do I get them talking? Well, I'm going to decommit and reopen this up. So some of it's ego, and some of it, quite frankly, like I said, the, the quarterback room, Penn State's fine. If, even if they don't get one this year, they're mm -hmm. most likely fine. All right, now let's get to one of the announcements made earlier this week. They've announced a lot of kickoffs. One of them was Georgia State at 730. Some pe uh, wait, 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 Georgia State. Yes. The Big Ten Network once thought it was Georgia Tech, not Georgia State, <laughs> and said, so, yeah, we got to put this right. in prime time. <laughs> right. But then again, you just made a really important point. Penn State has nothing to do with it mm -hmm. except playing the game. Football and men's basketball are television shows. Yes. Uh, and so in a TV time slot, it's the first opportunity that BTN has Penn State on all season, so they want them in prime time. Absolutely. So they tell you what time you're playing. Hey, and that's the thing, and Penn State fans are seeing it. Everybody was surprised by the Ohio State announcement on Fox, 3.30 kick. Well, World Series program, I mean, what do you expect? I mean, this is, this is how this thing works. So obviously that's a big hit for, for ticket sales when you look the fact that, you know, that's week three, three consecutive home games, 7.30 kick. We all know what hotel prices are in State College, <laughs> not great. Uh, so, so that's going to be an interesting one. Now, for me, I don't mind the night games. makes right. my job kind of easy. Right. Well, so far I've been able to avoid hotels yeah. <laughs> in State College. <laughs> we'll see a, if that lasts. I have, Steve. A, I, have a, I have a home. <laughs> <laughs> I have a home. Uh, beer sales in, the, in, in a stadium, in mm -hmm. any stadium. Jay, it's been really interesting because I've taken a long look at what's happened. Like West Virginia is a good example. I was down there a couple years ago yeah. and asked a couple people about it, and they said, you know, they, when they went to beer sales, the number of alcohol-related incidents in the stadium and outside the stadium plummeted because there wasn't this rush. But uh, you know, I think this is something you have to tread very, very carefully mm -hmm. on, yeah. and how you do it, and how you, how you present it, and how you handle it. And there's revenue to be made there, but the question is, at what cost? Right, and and it's, it's interesting because I think what in West Virginia, the thought was instead of binge drinking before, yeah. it was spread out far more evenly. Guys, thanks so much. Appreciate the time, Jay. Great to have you here, Audrey. Great to have you back. back. All right, thanks for joining us on the show. Back next month with another Blue White Pulse. We're looking forward to it. Great. Wow, wow.